Penner, owner of Plenty of Sunshine Travel. And today I'm joined by Kim from Viking Cruises. And today we're going to be talking about their tours over in Egypt. And I'm super excited about that. That is just an area that I have really, really wanted to go to. I find the pyramids so fascinating and I'm looking forward to learning more about it. So over to you. Well, thank you, Kathleen. And thank you for inviting me. Some of you may have joined me on a previous presentation. But it's really a treat to be able to share my experience in Egypt with you uh, because I know many of you are very uh, passionate travelers just like Kathleen. So I am going to take you through a day by day of our um, of our Egypt itinerary which takes you into Cairo as well as all along the Nile and you'll get a chance to learn a little bit about that 4,000 year old history. So I'm going to turn off my camera now and uh, take you uh, so you can see the big screen, and um, I'm going to just uh, take you on an incredible journey through ancient Egypt. I can't wait. So um, I wanted to start out with a little bit about biking. We have been uh, traveling around the world. Many of you know us from our river cruising. And here you can see a map of where we do travel. Egypt is considered one of our river cruises, and we do uh, normally travel around uh, all through Europe and other parts of the world by river, including Portugal, Central Europe, France, Russia, Ukraine, China, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, and today we're going to be visiting Egypt. Uh, we've been in the business for 23 years, starting off in Russia, and have expanded ever since. We've been in Egypt for close to, let's say, 10 or 15 years. And uh, we have created amazing experiences that are very destination focused. Uh, we've built programs that are culturally enriching, so you really do get a sense of the country uh, through the music, the, the art, the culture, as well as the destination experience. And we build those specifically for the clients that travel with us. And these are people that are super curious. I imagine if you're here joining me today on this virtual experience, you are a curious traveler, one who likes to explore, to learn, to understand different cultures, and to really learn about the destination uh, and, and what it has to offer both the people who live there as well as the people who come to visit. Uh, we do offer you all kinds of opportunities to learn before you go, including filmographies on our, on our My Viking Journey site, but also um, things like this, where you can come and join us virtually and experience the destination. Our Viking TV also offers some amazing opportunities for you. Uh, and particularly, we have some great videos on, um, and, and interviews actually, and virtual tours through various museums uh, that came to Egypt. So you can check that out in your leisure time as well. Once you're on board, we do offer a variety of cultural experiences. We bring on local entertainers and musicians, uh, and, and giving really the best part of any kind of travel, I think, is to be able to connect with people who are like you, who share your interests and your passion for travel, and you'll get a chance to meet those people as you're traveling with us. Uh, our onboard, one of the things we do include are short excursions in every port. And with Egypt, it's a very, very busy experience. We start early in the morning and we have tours that run um, almost throughout the day. I've had people come tell me that it's such a busy tour that they're exhausted by the time they get home. But I have to say, as much as I, uh, I, I, I didn't get a lot of rest on this tour, I, I loved every part of it. I really, really was able to, to learn. Um, the cultural curriculum gives you informative lectures. Uh, you get a chance to learn about the local cuisine, the port, charge, uh, the port talks, and we also do bring on local entertainers and musicians. So you get a chance to learn about the Nubian culture, for example, in Egypt. You'll get a chance to, uh, to visit uh, various different uh, uh, places to learn about what makes the economy tick as well. Uh, and in Egypt in particular, uh, as I mentioned before, we've been here, we've been in Egypt traveling, doing a variety of smaller guided tours for uh, 10 to 15 years. We have some really amazing local guides that work with us, and we also have just some of the best Egyptologists. In Egypt, people do have to be qualified. They have to go to university, become uh, a guide, a particular uh, Egyptologist. You have to know about the history and past uh, I think it's four years of university in order to do it. Uh, 
And uh, I wanted to just share this quote because it really reminded me of my experience. This is one of our guests who traveled uh, with us and they said, our Egyptologists brought a wealth of knowledge and enthusiasm to the history and storytelling of Egypt. We feel as if it completed, we completed a college course in the country's history and the entire two weeks flowed without a hitch. And I have to, I have to endorse that as well. I felt like I, I came home with books of notes <laughs> because there was so much to learn and I really didn't want to miss any of it. We include tours in all the ports and we also include some free time. So if you're like me and my husband, we like to explore a little bit on our own. We like to, to do a little shopping. We like to talk to the local um, market people. We like to uh, talk to the people who work, run the restaurants and just get a sense of what it's really like to live in these places. And so we give you that free time to be able to do that as well. But with our tours, we do build in uh, some of the key components that you'll find on other biking experiences through the biking way. Uh, this is our local life experiences, our working world, and our privileged access. And some of the things you can enjoy here are things like visiting the, the market in Cairo or uh, being able to sail along the river uh, in, uh, on a traditional felucca. You can, see, you can see the picture of the feluccas at the bottom of the page here. Uh, you get a chance to visit a local village and meet a Nubian family, to visit a local school, to learn about the Aswan Dam and how it's impacted the lives, and also have some privileged access. I'm going to share some of these as I go through the day by day. But that gives you a sense of the experience you can enjoy with us. And also, we do include, as I mentioned, a short excursion in each port of call, all your onboard meals. We include um, multiple dining venues, a lot of outdoor dining, so you can enjoy that as well. We include beer, wine, and soft drinks with our uh, lunch and dinner on board the ship. And I believe, uh, because we don't include all the meals in the hotels to give you some flexibility, we do include breakfast. But if it is an included meal, there is usually um, there is some sort of beverage included as well. On the ship, we do include our special tea, teas, and coffees. Bottled water is always available on the buses as well as on the ship. Uh, Wi-Fi is included on board the ship, and we do stay in first-class hotels, uh, and we do include um, the port charges and government fees in all of our tours. So that gives you a sense of, of just a quick overview on biking. But I want to dig a little bit deeper into the actual experience. And um, today we're going to be doing pharaohs and pyramids. We're going to be traving round trip between Cairo and Cairo. It's a 12-day trip. 11 guided tours are included, and we're going to visit one country. Now, I wanted to start with all of your people. So I am going to take you on a day-by-day -day and give you a little bit more background on it, but it is amazing uh, uh, as we go through. So here is the itinerary. We're going to start off in Cairo, where you get to spend three days, uh, and then onward to Luxor. We will be flying between Cairo and Luxor. We'll spend two nights there, and then we'll start to sail along the Nile, returning back to Luxor and then flying back to Cairo. So we, um, we have a map. And one thing I'm going to point out right here, uh, Kathleen, is that I really recommend that your clients, if they use, if they don't decide to come in on their own air rather than use Viking air, I really do encourage them to book um, a Viking transfer. Uh, I, I did that. I flew in on points and it made a huge difference. Cairo Airport is a crazy place. And it was just nice to have my Viking guide waiting for me when I came off the plane to help me through the, the visa process and also to, uh, to be able to take me directly through the chaos that's outside the Cairo Airport to a waiting car or, or um, coach. So um, it's, it's one of those great services that I know you provide. And I highly recommend that in Cairo because uh, it is crazy. So um, I wanted to show you the map just to give you a better idea. If you're like me, you're visual and, and looking at a list of itinerary uh, ports of call is not always give me the, the, um, the view I want. So here's the map. And uh, just a point of note that uh, you can do a pre or post in either Jerusalem or Jordan. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end as well. But um, today we're going to start off in Cairo. You can see where the airplanes go. They're going to fly you in and out of Luxor. And the red part is where we're going to be traveling along, uh, along the river. So um, 
I wanted to just give you a little background on the Nile before we get started. The Nile actually originates from Lake Victoria. Um, Lake Victoria is, is situated between Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And it runs from there, the waters run north uh, along the Nile about 4,300 miles from south to north. And it travels through four different African countries before draining into the Mediterranean Sea. So we're gonna be sailing along the best portion of it between Luxor and Aswan in Southern Egypt. So we are going to be um, arriving in Cairo. Um, often you arrive sort of mid, you know, uh, depending on when you fly in. I I did break my trip up and I stopped off in uh, Frankfurt on, on route, but you can fly right through. So if you're coming in with a Viking, uh, Viking Air, our guys will be waiting for you. If you purchase the, the um, the transfer on arrival, you can also be met and then we'll transfer you to our hotel. So Cairo is um, one of the, well, it's a, it's a huge capital. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it was founded in 969 as the capital of Egypt and now it's home for 21 million people. And for wow. centuries it's been, I know, isn't that amazing? Uh, when I looked at it at the time I went, it was almost the same population as Canada in one city. So when people often say, well, if something's going on in Cairo, are we going to be safe? Well, half the time you won't even know what's going on because it's so it's such a big city and it's it's nowhere near where we might be. So for centuries, it's been a stop up point for the Saharan caravans. And because of its prominent position on the Nile, it's been in the position possession of many different empires. So it's kind of a crossroads. It was home to the Ottomans, the British, the Romans the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Ptolemites. So it's really quite an amazing city and it's colored. It's split by the Nile, as you can see, which is the largest river in the world. And it includes two islands that you can see there, Gezira and Rhoda. And they're linked uh, back and forth to the mainland by different bridges. It's mm -hmm. the city also in the Middle East and, it, and also in Africa. So you can see it's very modern in sections of it with the, with the um, high rises, big wide streets, but most of its famed mosques, palaces, the city gates uh, are found in the older section, which is called Old Cairo. It's the southeast section. And it was also the original Egyptian capital of Babylon. It was also a Roman fortress city. Um, so it's kind of cool. Now we are gonna be staying at the Ritz-Carlton uh, Nile Hotel which is situated right along the Nile River. It has beautiful views of either the city or the Nile River. Um, I really loved it because it was very centrally located. It was about a half a block from Tarar Square, which is the main central square, which is where the Egyptian Antiquities Museum is located. And uh, all around it are um, hotels and there's restaurants, there's little, sh there's shopping. And both my husband and I went out. We both, uh, we walked along the streets. We had some lunch and we also did a little bit of shopping. So it is uh, well looked after. And Kathleen, I know you were asking me earlier about um, safety. Right. And yes. the thing I will say about the hotels, all the hotels we stayed in, uh, they had setups very similar to going through security at the airport with x-ray machines, they had guards and the only people that were allowed to come into the hotel were people who had business there or were staying at the hotel. And they were very strict about that. You had to show your hotel key in order to come in. So I felt really safe. And we stayed both in central Cairo and at a hotel that was closer to the airport, which I'll tell you about when we get back to Cairo. So um, this you'll have a chance to just relax and enjoy. The next morning, we're going out to see the pyramids. So I wanted to start, and here you can see some of the pyramids that we're going to be seeing today. But I wanted to start with a little background on the pyramids, just to give you a little idea, because it's quite fascinating. Uh, it, make, it helps you understand why these were built and uh, just what these different structures are. So they were built as tombs for dead pharaohs during the Old and the Middle Kingdom periods of Egyptian history. There are over a hundred of them that are still found throughout Egypt. The shape is thought to replicate the descending rays of the sun, which makes sense. Uh, they were faced with polished, highly reflective sand uh, limestone. And if you look on the right-hand side, the the temple or the pyramids that you see there, those are from the uh, the um, 
plateau of Giza. At the very top of the middle one, you can see kind of that, uh, the smooth part of the pyramid, that is the limestone that still exists, but they're actually made out of brick, which I was surprised by. When I got up close to them, they were not what I expected. And uh, it was quite fascinating to see, but if you can imagine, they were highly polished, highly reflective, which created a, you know, kind of a sparkling, a brilliance uh, when viewed from distance. The, the uh, limestone, um, as you can see, is still visible. Now, they also had a, sh they have a sh narrow shaft that runs from the burial chamber inside all the way up through the, the point of the pyramid, uh, which was suggested, at least that's what the uh, archaeologists think, is that it was designed to magically launch the, de the deceased pharaoh's soul directly to the home of the gods. So uh, that was fascinating because I had no idea there was this little hollow thing in the middle of these pyramids. You think they're yeah. solid. They're not yeah. uh, built, and the other thing is that they were built. All all of them are located on the west bank of the Nile, which is the site of the setting sun, and that's um, associated with the realm of the dead in Egyptian mythology. So, just okay. a little trivia in case that comes up in trivial pursuit sometime. <laughs> so that's uh, fascinating, though. That's really neat. Yeah, is that interesting? Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to start off on the left-hand side of the photograph, which is the necropolis at Saqqara. And this is near Cairo, and it holds tombs that date back to before 2686 BC. So, you know, that's basically 2,500 years. That's like 4,000 years before now, which you just, you, you, it just makes my head spin to think about it. Wow. And this is one of the most famous structures. It's called Dozier's Step pyramid. And up until this time, the pyramids, or they weren't pyramids, the burial chambers were kind of built as sort of lozenges or squares, similar, I always think they look like chiclets. Uh, they're called uh, mastabas. And you can see it on the bottom. So think that bottom layer was what the, the, the burial chambers used to look like. And this particular pyramid was built by uh, an architect called Imhotep. And he was the first to use the multiple uh, mastaba structure to stack one on top of the other to form steps that were thought to create a giant stairway in which the soul of the deceased could um, ascend to the heavens, which is yeah. a lot for him to get up rather than having to just launch from the bottom. Yeah. So uh, that's how that, that pyramid structure evolved. And you see it in Mayan culture. You see it in a variety of different uh, cultures around the world. So around the necropolis, there are more than 10 other pyramids, and they're uncovering more every single day. There's a large number of tombs and burial chambers, all of them in different states of repair. You can see that this one is being restored, and uh, this, is, this is actually a photo that we took when we were there, so it's progressed beyond, uh, beyond that. Um, most of these were lost be beneath the sands for close to 2,000 years. They didn't even know they were there. And many of the complexes are still really well preserved because of the dryness and the sand. Uh, so even their internal decorations are still intact, including some of the colors, which was quite interesting to me. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about this, there's a really cool Netflix show I just watched called Secrets of the Saqqara Tombs. You might want to look at that because it, it followed uh, 2018, I think it was. They uncovered three more tombs in this area. And it was fascinating, the process. So you might, if you're interested in Egyptian history and archaeology, you'll find that fascinating. So after lunch, we're going to go to the Giza Plateau, which is the World UNESCO Heritage Site that you see on the left hand, or on the right hand side. And here you're going to see the three great pyramids. They're called Chia, Chephren, and uh, Mekarionos. And these are recognized as the largest structures ever built. And they're, uh, they're part of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And nearby, you can see the Sphinx as well. And this is, uh, this is a mythical beast that was built almost 13 or 3,500 years ago. And it was, it was built to ward off the tomb raiders and the enemies of the pharaohs. Because they're in the process. I mean, and, and inside these pyramids is all of their wealth. It tells their story. And it also is filled with um, you know, uh, gold and 
it's amazing the stuff that you'll find and you'll see that at the Egyptian Museum. But it's uh, it's quite amazing. So while you're at the Temple of Giza or the Plateau of Giza, which literally is almost right inside of Cairo, you'll be shocked when you get there because it looks like it's out in the middle of the desert. It's not. If you turned around from the Sphinx, you could see high-rise apartments. Oh goodness! Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. I know. I had a picture, but I didn't want to ruin it for everybody. Yep. Because every picture you see, it's just, you know, looking at the pyramids and it looks like nothing was around them. Wow. But if, literally, if you turned around, you would see the city is almost surrounding it. Now, here you can also uh, take a camel ride if you want to. It's really fun. So you can check that out. But also beware of the vendors and the guys that are there. We're, we'll be protected with our own people. But people will be coming up to you and they want to jump in your picture. I was telling you earlier, they jump in your picture and then want to charge you money. Uh, for being in the picture. Uh, so you have to be quite firm with the no. Uh, mm. It's quite fun. So then you'll come back and, and you'll be able to relax at night, have dinner at the hotel if you like, or go out for a walk. And then the next day we're going to explore Cairo. And Cairo itself is fascinating because of its own history. And it's not just, it's the history beyond the um, the pyramids, obviously, and beyond the Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian world. So here we're going to see the citadel of the mount uh, of the mountain and the mosque of Muhammad Ali. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start off uh, at the citadel. The citadel was built in the 12th century uh, by Saladin el uh, Ayyubi, which was the he was a very famous king and military leader. It, it's located at the top of the highest hill in Cairo and overlooks the city. So you get a really amazing view of the different sections of Cairo. The construction was started in 1176 and was completed in 1182. And it's regarded as the most elegant fortress, fortresses constructed during the Middle Ages. And it served as the seat of the king and the government for many, many centuries. Now, inside, you will find this beautiful mosque. It's called the Mosque of Muhammad Ali. It's the largest Ottoman mosque ever to be built in the early 19th century. And it's, um, it's one of the most popular Islamic mosques in Cairo. And it's, um, it's not a typical structure in Cairo either. The mosque is different than what you'll see. And Muhammad Ali is buried beneath the white marble monument. On the right-hand side, you can see it. And it has a grill around it. So you'll get a chance to go in. Uh, I do caution you. One of the things I do recommend when you're traveling in Egypt, particularly the ladies, you must cover your shoulders. And um, you do need to be... Um, covered uh the knees need to be covered so i will give you some tips at the end of this presentation okay, yeah but it is something to be aware of and this mosque just reminded me that um you have to and the guys will tell will remind you that before uh the night before when you get when you you're going to be getting your wrap up for the next day from there you go back you can go back uh, well actually we're going to stop at the egyptian museum of antiquities which is really amazing so we'll see the mosque and we'll see the citadel and then we'll stop off at the museum, uh, which has the, one of the huge, largest collections of artifacts. And you'll also get a chance to visit the, um, the gallery of, uh, for King Tut. So the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian Museum is still located in Tarar Square. They're building a new one, which is, I think, hopefully due to open in 2021. But everything has been set back a little bit. This is considered yeah. the oldest. Yeah, I, you've maybe seen some of the pictures. Mm -hmm building it. Uh, it's one of the oldest, most famous, and largest museums in the world, and it covers about 5,000 years of history. It has 120,000 objects, uh, and uh, different. It holds the coffins, the huge statues, the stone carvings, and then you've got the upper floor, which has some of the smaller artifacts, including the, um, the items from King Tuck's tomb, including that gold mask that you see, or the golden sarcophagus, mm -hmm. which is looking at on that lower uh, left hand side one of the things i recommend it's an extra cost but it's highly worth it is to visit the mummy rooms the mummy rooms were just blew me away because the mummies um are of queen Hatshepsut and ramses the second and there are other mummies as well but they actually even have hair it's just incredible mm -hmm. so it would be yeah uh, yeah these are four thousand year old people goodness <laughs> Remarkable. And some of the clothing still preserved, again, because of the dry air and the sand, and of course the mummification that they did. 
So yeah. you'll you'll have an opportunity to to uh, do that. And then in the evening, uh, the afternoon is free. So you come back, you can have lunch, you can have a rest, or you can go out and do a little bit of, of uh, shopping, which we did. We bought some perfume and some beautiful perfume bottles. And then in the evening, there's an optional that I that I did, which I highly recommend. And it was an opportunity to go to the uh, the Connell Kalili Market, which is one of the largest markets. Uh, I think probably comparable to the one in Istanbul, which is crazy, the grand market there. Uh, but this one is filled with just amazing sites, including the spice market. You've got all this beautiful bronze. I bought um, shish kebab, uh, bronze shish kebab um, skewers that I use. I brought them home oh, for wow. yeah. a dollar a piece. They were okay. such, I'm not sure you could get them through anymore, but uh, they were in my suitcase, but they've made wonderful gifts. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that's something you might want to do a little shopping. And then you get to have dinner at a local restaurant. So you get to try the local cuisine. And the restaurant that we use is sits up on a uh, on a terrace and you overlook the beautiful city of Cairo, which comes to life at night. So you can have some fun with that if you like, or if you're just exhausted, you can just relax. Right. So the next day, going to fly to Luxor and it's about an hour's flight it's an early early morning start I will warn you about that mm -hmm. but, sorry I said uh-huh yeah I have no problem with early mornings so that's good yeah it is I mean you have to be prepared for early mornings because it is yeah. pretty chock block on this but I'm our ship is by 10 p.m but I can be up at 5 a.m with no problems <laughs> yeah there you go uh yeah. so we'll take uh we'll take the flight and uh we'll arrive in Luxor it's about an hour and then we will be boarding our ship, which is docked very nearby here. So what we're looking at right here, we're gonna, we, we, and remember we have, our Egyptologist has been with us in Cairo and they stay with us. It's kind of like they're our personal guide uh, and Egyptologist. And then we pick up local guides as we go through that add to it. But our, our Egyptologist was absolutely amazing. So here, um, this is the ancient city of Thebes. So if you have read Greek history or uh, Egyptian history will have read about the the, uh, the city of Thebes, and uh, this was um, this is it. So we're going to start off at the Temple of Karnak. This is the world's largest ancient ancient temple complex, and here you you can see that forest just on the on the right hand right hand side of the photograph. 136 ancient columns that once supported a towering ceiling and a huge sacred lake. It's really amazing to walk through. It's, it actually just is incredible. It's constructed over 1,300 years, and it was embellished by 30 different pharaohs. So it was an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. A lot of different input to it, too. So there's probably all different styles and different things yeah. along the way. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite remarkable. It's about, it's almost a mile by two miles in area. It has 25 temples, chapels. And the sheer size size of it makes it one of the most impressive complexes in all of Egypt. And it's situated, as you can see, right along the Nile, the bank of the Nile River, and the Avenue of the Sphinxes, or the Sacred Way. And this stretches two miles. There are 3,000 sphinxes. There's only a few of them that still exist. But it stretches all the way down to the Temple of Luxor. Now, the Temple of Luxor is another place that we visit. Um, we were fortunate to go late afternoon. So what we did is we we um, we went to the temple of, of Karnak first, then we came back, we relaxed, checked into our hotel or into our ship, and then we came back later in the afternoon so we could see uh, the temple and then be there when the lights came on as the sun was starting to set. It was remarkable. Mm -hmm. The temple of Lux, are you, so you can kind of see what it looks like. Some of these temples are remarkable at night because of the way they're lit and you really get a sense of the grandeur. Um, this one was built in the 14th century BC and it's unique in that there were only two pharaohs that were involved in the architectural structure, um, Amenhotep and Ramses II. So it, ha it actually housed a village within its walls and there are still several, several of the pylons or the walls they call those pylons, those walls that you're looking at, they're mm -hmm. are 70 yards long. And the first one is over 70 feet high. And in front of it are these massive statues and the obelisk. There were several obelisks at the time. The main entrance right now is flank, was flanked by six colossal statues, statues of Ramses. Four were seated and two were standing. Now the only ones that are left 
are the two sitting ones. Uh, the others, I believe, have gone to the British Museum. And, uh, and uh, also the obelisk, which is um, 50 feet tall, it's pink granite. It, uh, it was one of two at the, at, at the front entrance. And this, the, uh, the pair to it is now sitting in the Place de la Concorde in Paris. It was taken back to Paris. Okay. So that out. I know, amazing, hey? So yeah. it's remarkable to walk through here. I took some incredible photographs. Um, it just, it, it, the grandeur, the size, you just, you, and just the sheer ability to construct something like this is it just to me. Yeah, so, I would definitely want to bring an extra memory card for that because that's something you yeah. don't want to run out of space for. Yeah. No, you don't. And and it really is quite remarkable. So you can have a good night's sleep. And then the next morning, if you want to get up really early, as I did, uh, I got up at four in the morning and we went off to do a balloon ride. It's an optional tour. It cost us about, I think it was around 200 US per person. Okay. But I tell you, it was one of the most amazing things. It's what, you know, sometimes you have those pinch me moments. Kathleen, this was one of those where yeah. I just, it had been a dream of mine, a bucket list dream, and I was not disappointed. So you arrive early in the morning and the balloons fill, it's dark, you've got the colors, you've got the fire from the, from, uh, as they, you know, fill the balloons and then you take it silent and you fly over top of the Valley of the Kings and the Queens that you see there. This was actually, this picture was taken from our balloon. So there were probably, I don't know how many balloons up in the sky. It was remarkable. But you can see what I wanted you to see specifically was that, you know, if you if studied the desert, you know that there used to be oases. And then there was desert. And people are always looking for the oasis because that's where the water was. Well, here you can see a, a strong demarcation of where the irrigation of Luxor stops and the desert begins. And this is, you can see it very clearly when you get up high, but you can also see some of the temples that are being uncovered in the Valley of the Kings and Queens as you fly over it. It was remarkable. So wow. you know, yeah. and we got champagne and orange juice and the croissants, and then we came back and finished our breakfast. And then we went off to visit the Valley of the Kings and the Queens uh, face to face. And how many others were with you up in the balloon? Is that about a group of eight well, people or is it more? Uh, I think there's about 12, 10 or oh, 12 okay. in the balloon basket. Yeah, that's a doable number. It's, you know, you still have your personal space and you can get all the pictures that you want. So that's really neat. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, it was phenomenal. I've done it also in um, over Bagan in uh, in Myanmar, in Burma. Uh, that was another highlight. But honestly, my first my first balloon ride, I will never forget. It was magical. Yeah. So uh, if you if you're not afraid of heights and you don't mind, you know, I the way I look at it, you can't take your money with you. You might as well enjoy it. I know that the uh, I know the um, the pharaohs wanted to keep it with them with all their gold, but you know, yep. in this age, experiences are what count. I think. Mm -hmm. so, uh, enjoy Making it. Those memories, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's just amazing. So today we're going to visit a couple of different things in at the Valley of the Kings and Queens. The first stop is going to be. The uh, Colossus of Memnon, those two monumental statues that you see there, they're uh, King uh, Amenhotep III, and they stand 60 feet high and they weigh 200 and, or, or 720 tons each, and they are carved out of single blocks of sandstone. Now, there was a huge mortuary. It was the largest temple in the area, but because of earthquakes and floods, because it's not far from the, the riverbanks, so remember this area used to flood frequently, uh, the temple's gone, but all that's left are these two statues. So we'll stop there. And then we're also going to go into, um, just on the outside of the Valley of the Kings, is this incredible temple of al Dir um, al-Bahari, which is the uh, temple of the burial chamber for Queen Hatshepsut, And she ruled um, in the 1400 BCs. She was the first female ruler of ancient Egypt, and she re she reigned as a male uh, with the full authority of a pharaoh, which is really unusual. They, I think they, this is the one that, uh, oh, what did Elizabeth Taylor play? Cleopatra. She might have been um, fashioned after. Okay. So she began her reign as a regent for her stepson, and uh, he eventually succeeded her. But initially, she is depicted as a woman. 
in the statuary. But around the seventh year of her reign, uh, she chose to be depicted as a male pharaoh in the statuary with a bare chest and a beard. So you'll see that transition when you visit this particular uh, temple. It's quite amazing. And again, uh, Rick Steves does a really fantastic uh, presentation on the Valley of the Kings that you might want to check out as well. Um, her temple uh, remains one of the most impressive and one of the most visited in Egypt. It's set against the cliff and it's actually cut into the cliffs. Uh, and it's just outside the Valley of the Kings. And it rose directly from the riverbank with a long ramp that went up from uh, along a courtyard of trees. And some of the uh, tree trunks are still exist. They're petrified wood now, but you can still see them in the courtyard. It was, it was, it was fascinating. Wow. So you can check that out. Yeah, um, this particular temple was so admired by the pharaohs that came after her that they increasingly chose to be buried nearby and that necropolis eventually became known as the Valley of the Kings. So she was one of the first. So um, that whole Valley of the Kings that you can kind of see from the balloon uh, dates back uh, nearly 500 years. It was over a period of 500 years from the 16th to the 11th century and there are 63 tombs constructed for the kings and the powerful nobles and it became um, a World Unesco Heritage Site in 1979, probably one of the most um, fascinating places in the world. So this is where you'll find the most concentrated archaeological and Egyptolo uh, Egyptological exploration since the end of the 18th century. Uh, and this is where it came. And probably one of the most um, famous discoveries, of course, was King Tut. Uh, and it led to the rumors of the, the curse of the pharaohs. Uh, and just a little bit of uh, another piece of information. It was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922, which, and he was a very famous archaeologist, but he was financed by Lord George, uh, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Now, Carnarvon, the Earl of Carnarvon reigns over Highclere Castle in England, which of course we know is Downton Abbey. So there's a, an incredible private collection of Egyptian artifacts at Downton Abbey or at Highclere Castle that you can check out. But they say that he was the first of the, uh, the first person to be struck down by the curse of the pharaohs when he died from, a, from blood poisoning um, from a mosquito bite two weeks after he had opened the tomb of King Tut. So um, interesting stuff, eh? Yeah, yeah, I remember that whole story of that. That's fascinating. Yeah, so you can check that out. Um, and actually that Rick Steves show that I watched, has a lot of background on that. It was fascinating, but there's also on TV a great presentation and walk through their private collection and down at uh, Highclere Castle. Now, one of our privileged access experiences with biking is the opportunity to go into Queen Nefertari's tomb, which is not open generally to the public. And this is a fast, fantastic tomb. It's kind of known as the Sistine Chapel of ancient Egypt, and she was chief wife of Ramses II. She was the chief uh, wife, and he had eight wives, but this one was his true love. So you'll see her depicted at Abba Simbel, as well as he built this beautiful temple for her that really depicts her life and her uh, relationship with the gods. So it's fantastic. You'll get a chance to walk through. But what is fascinating here, of course, is the color. This mm -hmm. is, I didn't expect. I mean, these are 4,000 years old. It's crazy. Yeah, so from, yeah, I was going to say that. The color is phenomenal, yeah. I know. And this is probably the one that I saw that, that wowed me the most. This is Dendera. This is at Cana. So this is, we'll sail and we'll stop in Cana the next day. And we're going to visit this temple, which is the, it's one of the best preserved temples. And it's on the west bank of, of the Nile, as it should be. And it's, um, it's right on the edge of the desert, but it dates back to the mid-fourth century. And uh, they say that it's been, it's existed here, though, since 2250 BC. It's the Temple of Hathor. And it's, uh, so it started out probably as an Egyptian or a Greek temple. And then the Ptolemites came and they, they built onto it or built over it, which is often the case. They built on top of things. And um, what it has is this incredible color in it. A lot of this is being cleaned. So when we were, when we were there, um, I saw the actual um, cleaning that was going on. So one half of the, of 
the hieroglyphics had been clean and the other half was still covered with soot and dirt of centuries. But they found um, new ways of cleaning that doesn't destroy the, um, the original colors. So it's quite remarkable. So when you go watch for the Dendera Zodiac, which is a bas-relief uh, sculpture from the Greco-Roman times, and also, um, and the French, the, the French took the zodiac back to the Louvre, so you can check it out there. And then you can also check out the Dendera Light, which is uh, three apparently three stone reliefs depicting what some say is ancient Egyptian electro, electrical lighting technology. Um, it was that was pretty cool. It's all designed the, the way the temple's designed, so that the sunlight and the moonlight comes through to create light. It's really something. Yeah. So, yeah, from there on, we're going to go to Asna. And, you know, if you've had enough temples by now, this is a great place to go and explore the market. Asna is a quiet little farming town with a lively market scene. So you can take a short walk from the pier right into town and you can uh, spend some time at the market. If you want to do some shopping, check out the fabrics. It's got beautiful fabrics and it's also got... Um, lots of um, spices. It's fun to bring back the spices as long as they were, a lot of them are vacuum sealed. Um, and then we go, uh, you can check out some of the 19th century homes that are along the streets as well. But if you want to see some of the, the temples, there is the uh, Temple of Kunum, which is situated right in the center of town. And it was thought to be one of the latest temples built by the ancient Egyptians. And um, it is... Um, it's right in the center, and the only part of it that's been uncovered is this hip, the hip style hall with all of these intricate designs. So you can check that out if you like, but you may want to take a little break from temples and uh, go to the market as well. And then from there, we're going to sail along the Nile en route to Aswan. Now, Aswan is a bustling market, market city, and we're going to spend two days here, so you'll get a chance to explore a lot of different things. You'll get a chance to go to the market, to check out the palookas. You might be able to go and learn about the, um, uh, oh, it's gone right out of my head. Some of the other temples that are around, take a ride on the palooka. So we're gonna start off with a tour of the Aswan Dam. Now the Aswan Dam really changed things uh, along the Nile because it used to flood, it used to uh, dry up. And it, you know, it was just a really, really difficult uh, Thing to control because it's such a huge river. So it's the Aswan Dam was originally built, the first one was built in 1906, and then the second Aswan Dam came in 1960. And it's um, this rock-filled dam that's located at the north border between Egypt and Sudan, and it's fed by the Nile River, and it's, it, it has its reservoir in Lake Nasser. So when the dam was built, there were, it was just, it used to just destroy the crops and it created problems with food supply and all of that. So that's what's happened. So you'll get a chance to go. You'll see this. You'll get to um, actually learn about the two different dams and get a chance to see that. And then you've got some other options. So you can um, you can take a palooka ride. You can go to the local market. Uh, some of these things, the palooka ride was included and the tour to the market. So that was available. So you've got two days here. So you've got some options. <clears throat> If you want to do a full day uh, tour to Abba Simbel, which I highly recommend. I did that. I know my tour was a little bit different in that we sailed along Lake Nasser to Abba Simbel, but to be able to, this from here, you fly from Aswan by small plane to Abba Simbel, you spend the day and then you come back. It is remarkable. You can see on the top right, uh, right hand side how huge this is. Look at how tiny the people are compared to those temp those. Uh, statues of Ramses. They're, they're crazy. So this is an interesting um, temple because with the second dam, the, the flooding and creating the lake, uh, the, the lake, it covered up many of the temples in the Nubian, uh, the Nubian region as well as this particular one. Many of them were actually moved brick by brick back. So they were moved from the riverbank back, so they were protected from the rising water of the lake. But at the symbol was going to be covered. And what happened is that the, um, the international community came together, the UNESCO World Heritage people, and they raised money. And literally, at the very last minute, they cut this temple to pieces, block by block, and they physically moved it and created uh, 
a new site that was as, si as similar to what where it came from as it could possibly be, and they reconstructed this temple. It, 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 That's painstaking it, work. My goodness. Oh my God, it's just amazing. So I highly recommend if you can go to go, you will get a chance to see the twin temples. They're carved out of the mountainside originally during um, and so they actually created a mountain or a hill that they could build this back into it's it dates back to the 13th century and it's a lasting monument to himself and his queen Nefertari. now I, I, I this is all canadians right so um ramses is probably as close to mr trump as you can get <laughs> he, he was a guy who was very good self-promotion and he would love to tell everybody about it so all of his temples have all of his the stories of all of his conquests true or not that but they're all there so it's quite it's kind of like media from the Egyptian period it's quite something so you'll see here that he's uh, commemorated his alleged victory of the Battle of Kadesh and these were all done to um, intimidate his Nubian neighbors because that was the other reigning um, empire of the time so it is really quite phenomenal and then you can fly back we have another day in Aswan and you can go to the Papyrus Institute if you're interested to learn about how uh, that's all formed and and, pres and preserved the stories of the Egyptians that they found in the temples and you all we also will go to the temple of Isis at Philae Island and this is one of the great temples of Egypt it was constructed during King Ptolemy II uh, during the New Kingdom, and it was founded 380 to 362 BC. So remember, we started with the Egyptians back in like 2000 BC, and now we're up almost to uh, to, BC, uh, to changing, and we've already crossed into almost into AD. Wow. Temple um, of Philae was an ancient pilgrimage center for the cult of Isis. Now, in this area, there were lots of different cults, and they built their own temples. There was even one in and around Saqqara that was to cats. They, um, cats were very important in Egypt, and there was a temple that was de dedicated to cats and the worship of cats as well, so that was kind of cool as well. Um, so this one had to be relocated as well during the flooding uh, caused by the Aswan Dam. So you can see, I've got the two pictures at the bottom, where it was, what it looked like when it was flooded, and what it looks like now. They built a new island, and they relocated it block by block in 1971, uh, again, by UNESCO, uh, onto this island that they created to imitate the original island of Bile. So um, you can check that out. It was, it was quite fascinating to see. My, the Egyptologists with us had a lot of these pictures that showed these transitions, and that part was fascinating in itself. So our last two stops it's, uh, is going to be Como Ombo, this is one of the stops that we're going to make en route in the afternoon after we leave Aswan. We're going to be working our way back along the Nile and visit the Temple of Koma Umbo. This is actually two temples in one. It's perfectly symmetrical. One side is dedicated to Horus, the Vulcan god, and the other is, is dedicated to Sobak, who is the crocodile god. And he's an effective deity that created, apparently created the world. So there's actually an area where they found 300 mummified crocodiles in the area and a lot of them are displayed inside but what else is cool about this and you can see our guide is pointing something out this is on the inside of this wall it depicts a series of surgical instruments and tells of medical operations like brain surgery as well as how to anesthetize people using opium water and the sanitation uh, techniques that were used like washing before treatment so how interesting is that to see yeah. that get yeah. in the hieroglyphics? Like, I mean, two, 2,000, 4,000 so years ago. So long ago, and yet they had that know. technology and that, um, but that intelligence yeah. to be able to do that. Wow. Yeah, exactly. So that was cool. And then our last stop is the Temple of Edfu. And Edfu is dedicated to the falcon-headed god of light. And this one was built during the Ptolemaic dynasty. It's one of the best preserved temples. And honestly, on my trip, this was the only place where there were huge crowds. All of the other places I went to, there weren't a lot of people. Again, I was traveling really off season. As I told you, I went not too long after the Arab Spring, so there weren't a lot of tourists. And it's the same right now. Um, those who go back 
earlier than later are going to find less people and it's probably going to be easier to see a lot of things so here again if you've had enough temples which you will find yourself almost templed out um, you may want to check out the um, the market as well and we actually traveled to this one by a horse and cart which was very fun mm -hmm. so you get to see this and uh, you can also go with our resident chef and hear him talk about the evening's planned tasting menu at the market so uh, that's something you can do that might be a little bit different and then back to Luxor here you can see some of the falcon some of the hieroglyphics and then from there we fly back to, we go back to Luxor and we fly onward to Cairo and we stay overnight again. Now we dock right, uh, we, we stay right near the airport. So I told you it's 21 million people. The city is immense. So to get you from the airport to downtown Cairo, it can take an hour or, or longer. So we, we uh, put our guests, because usually it's early morning flights that are leaving, no matter where they're going. We put them at a hotel that's near the airport. Uh, we use the City Star, the Cairo City Stars Hotel, which was which was beautiful and it's attached to a shopping center, and across the street is, um, is some other really cool the Coptic Quarter and the Jewish synagogues. So you can check that out if if that history is there. But if you want to do some last minute shopping, it's a great place to do that, and then you can just relax, have dinner, and be ready to go the next morning. So that is our tour. Now, if you want to That's add, on, I do recommend a couple of different things. We have Green Post. Jerusalem, probably one of the most, the top five places I've been in the world. It was probably one of the most moving, incredible places. And um, I, I mean, I grew up in the United Church, so I, I knew, obviously, it was all the Bible stories. My husband right. is, is, grew up in the Catholic Church, and he was more familiar with the Stations of the Cross. But honestly, to go to Jerusalem, Kathleen, have you been? No, I haven't. Um, many people in our church have been to Jerusalem, and it, it's a place that they talk about very, very highly as well, though. It's an incredible place because many of us grew up in the church and knew the Bible stories. But when you go and you actually see these places, all of a sudden, these Bible stories make sense. Yeah. And they something because they, they're real. They yeah. happened in real places. So we have a wonderful four-night tour, and four nights is enough. You really do get a chance. I don't know um, with this one, you've got lots to see in Jerusalem, and you can do that. The other thing that's really cool um, is if you want to start out, you can start out in England with a incredible tour of the British collections. And this is a really small group that gets to do something really unique. And they will get to trace some of the world's great um, uh, stops. So they get private access to a variety of private collections as well as stay in some really beautiful um, country homes. So for those who are interested, that's something I highly recommend for those who might be interested uh, mm -hmm. in that particular experience. And then our, uh, the other thing you can do hang on, is Jordan and Petra, which I am very disappointed I didn't extend, but I was running out of time in my vacation. Right. And so I had to come home, but I, I wouldn't do Egypt without going to Jordan and Petra. Okay. It, it, Anybody I've talked to uh, says that it, it is so remarkable. And here you get to see the, the Dead Sea uh, from the Jordan side. Jordan itself is beautiful, but you also get to go to Petra, which is you have to hike in. So you do have to be fairly agile and, and uh, somewhat, you don't have to be like fit to climb mountains, but you, it is a walk in. Yeah. And uh, it's, but anybody that I've I've talked to that's been has just been incredibly wowed by the whole experience so something to think about in terms of building on your if you're going to go that far don't miss yeah. it don't miss yep. jerusalem don't miss petra those are two unless you go back i mean you can do jerusalem on a mediterranean eastern mediterranean cruise and we have some really amazing mm -hmm. tours that do spend two or three days in israel which gives you time to see some of these places but you don't get to go to Jordan, and um, I highly recommend it. So just a quick overview, I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to share a quick overview on our ships so you know what we're dealing with. And um, we do have three ships there. The newest ship is coming out uh, in May, I think, of 2021, and it's called the Osiris. And this one is being built specifically for us. It uh, looks like some of our other Viking ships, and it's built navigate the Nile and it's got all of the things that you would find 
on our Viking ships that same Scandinavian aesthetic, outdoor deck space, we've got beautiful rooms, and it, it accommodates just 82 guests, so 40 suites, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the largest of the three that we have. The Antares uh, is a Viking operated ship. This one is not built, we didn't build it, but it is a charter, full ship charter for us, and it's our ship and all of our staff on board. So this one, uh, you can, it's, it's built, it was built just a couple of years ago. And it has all of the same equi all the same um, things that we have on our other ones, but and it accommodates just 62 guests. And then we have the Viking Raw, which was built specifically for us, and it's only 52 guests. So this one, you've got three different choices. They're all beautiful. The, the Raw is all sweet, state of the art. And again, with that Scandinavian design. So we've got beautiful, comfortable places for you to stay. And of course, the five-star hotels, um, all of those things are there. So I want to deal with a few tips because a lot of people always ask me these questions. And having been there, I thought I would share some of the things that I learned. Absolutely. Uh, some of them maybe, um, yeah, just to be prepared. I do a lot of traveling, so uh and I've been to a lot of these places and I've learned over the years that there are certain things you need to tuck into your backpack or your fanny pack. Right. But people always ask me about currency is the Egyptian pound, but US dollars were widely accepted. There are ATMs in all of the large cities, uh, but not some of the smaller towns. And we don't have ATMs on board the ships, I don't think, because of banking regulations and things like that. So um, the ATMs were in all of the main hotels that we used. That wasn't hard. You'll find them on the streets, Luxor, there were there were ATMs as well. But uh, also with any of these, make sure that your PIN works and your bank knows you're leaving. You can do that online nowadays. It's just a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. I've had credit cards and credit card companies call me and say, somebody's charging stuff in Egypt. Is that you? <laughs> and um, And they've locked my card. So... I've had to call them back and say, yeah, that's me, so let it go. But it's, it's better to do that in advance, just in case. And it then, is. Yeah. Um, and then also make sure that I always travel with those small packages of Kleenex you get at the dollar store. Um, I put them in my backpack. I put them in my pockets. I put them in my fanny pack because what I found is traveling all over the world is getting to restrooms and they're not set up the way we are used to. Like, oh, dear. Yeah. And that's something you really want to be able to use is the restrooms. Yeah. And um, sometimes you have to remember to pick it up before you leave. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've got the Kleenex, you're good. And right. anti <clears throat> the antibacterial hand wipes, as we're all used to now, mm -hmm. um, yep. better than sanitation gel. You need sanitation gel as well. But the wet wipes, if you can still find them, um, are really helpful because with the dirt, I mean, these are big cities with lots of cars and not pollution control like we're used to. In North America, you do feel grimy. And sometimes it's, it's nice to make sure you feel clean. Make yeah, sure that's that a good point. Because yeah. the hotels are 220 on the ships. Uh, we've, got the, we've got the conversion, but not in the hotels. And then in visas, Kathleen, you probably know this, you do need a visa for Jordan, for Egypt, and most of these can get, you can get them at the airport. It doesn't take very long. Okay. Uh, you can do it when you're there. You may be able to do it in advance now, a lot more electronic stuff, or e visas, but yeah. I didn't think it was a problem, and my, um, our guides were there to help us. It was really helpful. And then I wanted to share uh, a little bit about clothing, because as I mentioned, for the ladies in particular, a lot of these places, particularly the mosques and things that you'll see in Cairo, you want to be conservative. You want, and, and I usually travel with um, sort of long, loose skirts and T-shirts that have got my shoulders covered, um, mm -hmm. simply because if it's hot, it's hot during the day, and it's often cooler if you've got a sundress or a skirt on than than pants. But yes. capri fine. You just want to have your knees covered, or a shawl that you can either wrap around your waist or wrap around your shoulders. And mm -hmm. also in the evening, it cools off because it's desert. Hot during the day, once the sun's down, it's cool. So uh, I, I bought pashminas there in the market, which were a great value. But you, uh, you want to make sure that you've, you've always got something kind of tucked in your backpack because it's probably going to come in very handy. And then comfortable shoes. Um, I would recommend not sandals because of the sand. Uh, right. 
Dang is really hot. Yes. Yeah. Running shoes or something with closed toes. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And more importantly, don't overpack. <laughs> I have to I have a big sign when I go to pack for any trip, don't overpack. Take out yeah. half. That's a hard one to do sometimes. It's, I know. Um, I've heard the old but, adage, take out half your luggage and put double your cash. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yeah. I, I was able to go to Egypt with just a 22 inch, you know, one of those little carry ons and a backpack. And then I think what we did is we bought an extra suitcase cheap in Cairo to put all of our goodies in to bring home. That's smart. But my husband did challenge me and I was able to do it. So that's where the long skirts come in handy because you can just change out the tops or capris. Yeah. Change no one's going to recognize no one's going to know except you and your photographs so yeah. if you change up the accessories you'll be good maxi skirts are incredibly comfortable in the heat like you said the sundresses are, are cooler than shorts they're wonderful yeah. for for in the heat so. yeah and i always find that then i'm i'm covered and i don't have to worry because you will see people in a job you will see people in full burqa in cairo in and around so you just find that you do feel and make sure you've got a good hat i found that that was very helpful as well so okay, because they had to cover their heads or because of the sun uh for the sun more than anything i mean you may find i mean if you've got a scarf in a scarf in your backpack or in your in your purse and again with like anything pickpockets are all over the place Damn. so just recommended i carried a fanny pack and i had a backpack but nothing that of, of any value went with me it stayed on the ship in the in the safe Mm -hmm. and, um, I didn't take a lot of cash, but I did take local cash, and I just made sure that everything stayed in front of me. I have one of those um, those safe pack purses. It's a small one, but it can't be slashed. Mm -hmm. uh, I can um, that one works really well because I can do it like a messenger bag, and I can hang it around um, my weight. I can keep it in the front of me, or I can put it underneath a jacket or a sweater, or whatever. And, and protect it. Yeah. Yeah, you just want to be what I call street smart. Just just be aware of what's going on around you all the time. And you do that anywhere you travel. If you go to New York, you have to do it. Absolutely. Go to you yep. probably have to do it. So mm -hmm. it's be a little bit attentive. Don't look like a tourist, like you're staring up at everything. Just just be aware of the world around you and two two things will come. You won't get robbed and you might see some stuff that you didn't even realize. Right. So, Wonderful. so I'm going to turn my camera back on just to say goodbye. But I hope I hope that was what you're looking for. I hope your people are excited about Egypt and uh, being able to travel a little farther afield and off the beaten track. It is an amazing destination and one that I think your guests will really enjoy. Yes, I absolutely want to go more now than ever. And I wanted to go before. So that's something yeah. right there. So it's phenomenal. Thank you so very much for putting all that together. And for taking the time, I greatly appreciate it. On this intriguing 12-day itinerary, you can immerse yourself in ancient secrets, long buried in desert sands, while enjoying the welcoming culture of Egypt as you explore with Viking. Your journey begins with a three-night stay in Cairo, the cradle of civilization, during which you can gaze upon the world's oldest step pyramid at Saqqara. The Great Pyramids, the stunning Sphinx, and enjoy Cairo's Museum of Egyptian Antiquities. You'll also have ample time to check out the city on your own. Luxor is next, unfolding before you for two amazing days. Satisfy your curiosity at the great temples of Luxor and Karnak, and the remarkable Valley of the Kings. Here, you'll enjoy privileged access to the tomb of Queen Nefertiri, an exquisitely preserved site only a few visitors have the chance to see. In Cana, discover the sprawling complex of Dendera and its fascinating Temple of Hathor. Built by the Ptolemies and Romans in classic Egyptian style, it's one of Egypt's best preserved and less frequented temples. Isna is home to the red sandstone temple of Kanam, the first century hippostyle hall filled with intricately carved columns and detailed hieroglyphics. You'll sail on to Aswan and the serene Philae Sanctuary, 
This oasis was rescued from the rising waters of the Aswan Dam and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Or set out for Abu Simbel on an optional excursion to admire the great temple of Ramses II. A picturesque voyage along the Nile River brings you to Edfu, where you'll visit the Temple of Horus, the Falcon God. It's one of Egypt's best preserved temples and an impressive remnant of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Your exotic Viking journey concludes back in Cairo with free time to explore more of Egypt's intriguing culture. Thank you so much for watching this week's cruise chat. I certainly enjoyed talking with Kim about their Egypt itineraries. It was just beyond fabulous to see some of the those pyramids and to see the um, the tomb of Nephrodites with all of the color. It was just amazing to to see that, and I think it would be even more impressive to see it with your own eyes. And it was just great. And I, I appreciate Kim putting all that together for us. Next week, I'm going to be meeting with Beverly from Regent Seven Seas. And we're going to be discussing one of their itineraries. And Regent Seven Seas is a really amazing cruise line in that every last thing that you could want is covered. From the moment you leave your door to when you get off and head back home and, and arrive back at your home. So your flights are included. Your transfers are included. Everything that you do is on board is included. It's just it's phenomenal. You have to tune in to learn more. So thank you so much for watching. If you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, be sure to check out all my other episodes. And we are on um, Spotify. We're on Google Podcasts and iTunes as well. And it's Cruising the Waves podcast. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook, um, Plenty of Sunshine Travel. Thank you so much for watching. And be sure to tune in next week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye.